hello, how are we all doing? Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to join us today and to watch this video. Um, I am so delighted that Athletics Ireland were interested in hosting this webinar with me and for giving me the platform to share today's topic. This is the first topic in a series of two webinars that will be available to watch on Athletics Ireland's social media channels such as YouTube. I know we've already had some sports nutrition webinars hosted by Athletics Ireland in their webinar series, but I hope that this one will offer a slightly different slant and one that resonates with some people. Firstly, I wanted to introduce myself and let you know how I came to this journey and way of working. I am Katie Kirk and I'm a sports and exercise nutritionist based in Northern Ireland. I've also taken time and money to educate myself further and have done additional training in non-diet nutrition counselling skills, intuitive eating, eating disorders in sport and body image for athletes. I'm committed to promoting non-diet sports nutrition and this may be slightly different to some of the messages you've heard before. I'm also an 800 meter runner and I have struggled personally in the past with disordered eating and exercise, but I do not center my work or opinions on my experiences, but they have resulted in me seeking out an alternative to the restrictive and dieting messages normally promoted in sports nutrition are common in the culture of athletics and are found everywhere in non-sports settings too. How can you get the most out of today's session and what have I done to encourage your learning in this webinar? I really think webinars online can be a little bit impersonal and I feel there is, isn't as much interaction as if we were in person. But we are also working in the time of pandemic and it can really offer unique opportunities to learn remotely which we mightn't have the access to otherwise. This is also a difficult time for many and if any of the topics today are too difficult to fully engage with, that is okay. This presentation is not intended to give you serious motivation to make crazy changes, but is intended to give you a gentle nudge into considering why our beliefs about eating and exercise are the way they are and to encourage non-judgmental non non reflection on what we are currently doing with this, what we are currently doing. With this type of work, you also need to do the work and simply being provided with information is not enough to result in learning and changing of habits or beliefs. So I will be encouraging individual reflection throughout today's session. So pause the video, grab, the, grab a pen or piece of paper to have handy. This will help your learning and help to relate to the topics to your own life. So what are we covering today? This is going to be our plan of action. Um, my aim is to have a little bit of education around exact, what exactly disordered eating is, encourage reflection from any athletes or coaches that are tuning in, and aiming to potentially change attitudes and beliefs about weight and performance in a non-judgmental and safe way. You don't have to agree with everything I'm talking about, but please take the time to consider why that might be. Not all athletes watching may have experienced disordered eating or exercise behaviors, but we want to help those who are struggling and help those who have done it in the past and also prevent it for those who haven't experienced it. The intention of this is not to diagnose, but if you're concerned about your own behavior or the behavior of an athlete you work with, please take the necessary steps to either get help or encourage them to seek help. So what is disordered eating? There isn't really a simple definition of what exactly it is because it can look so different in everyone basically. But it is described as abnormal eating behaviours which are not normal eating patterns and are often accompanied by a sense of shame, guilt, anxiety or another negative mood state. Now for some clarifications. Disordered eating is not the same as a clinical eating disorder but someone who has an eating disorder will have disordered eating. And we also know from research that disordered eating is a risk factor in itself or might increase the risk for an eating disorder in some people, but not all people. That does not mean that everyone who has disordered eating or engages in disordered eating will get an eating disorder, but for some people it can lead to that. I feel that wasn't very concise, but hopefully it means we are on the same page. So it can be described as a spectrum. Um, I don't really love this diagram where it shows kind of normal disordered and then the eating disorder, but for the sake of the presentation, it does represent well that they are also different but related to each other. Um, it is not that at one point in time, it is not that one person is always normal eating, always disordered eating, or on any of the other things. 
It's not black and white like that. Our eating behaviors change and move at practically every meal. But the idea is that we want people to mainly stay closer to the normal eating pattern section for most of the time and obviously avoid the eating disorder end of the scale. We do have to be very careful when discussing, discussing these topics and that's why I highlight that eating is not fixed. Like for example, if you oversleep and miss breakfast once or twice or don't like crisps, but so you don't eat them, it doesn't necessarily mean you have disordered eating. What you need to try and do is work out if food and eating are causing you problems or whether you're maybe just particular about the food that you eat. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was the culture in athletics. The culture of food in athletics, food and exercise beliefs in athletics, is determined by many different things. There will also be microcultures that exist, such as specific training groups, athletics clubs, friendship groups within the sport, and possibly family unions. We also can't forget that general food culture of our community will also influence the culture in our athletics world and that social media is also having an increasing role in influencing and forming people's beliefs around food, exercise and their bodies. The culture can change and I believe with increased awareness of eating disorders and relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS that this might help to change attitudes about food and exercise. But there is definitely still a remaining conflict while we understand that those issues of eating disorders and reds are serious there are still strong remaining beliefs around what athletes should look like the role that weight plays in performance and the assumption that those in larger bodies that participate in sport do not experience eating disorders disordered eating or reds is it possible that while awareness of these things has increased people don't really believe that it is a problem or that there isn't really a suitable alternative presented to them that offers an alternative to the dieting messages that we are, we are shown. So our first pause for the day, um, I hear this so often, this phrase in situations or where it's maybe implied. So what have you heard or what are your beliefs about food and exercise behaviors that are normal for athletes? To start you off, I will give a few examples that I have heard or that people have shared with me in clinic. So, it is normal for athletes to look malnourished when in peak competition form. It is normal for athletes to have a strict eating regime. It is normal for athletes to not eat carbs. It is normal for athletes to feel hungry all the time. It is normal for athletes to not eat cake and sweets. It is normal for athletes to control their weight. It is normal for athletes to not take rest days. So what I want you to do is pause this video and take a few minutes to think about what is normal or accepted in your culture and community to do with food and exercise. It might also be useful to bring up this conversation at your training group and see, what other, see the other things that people around you come up with. It might be quite eye-opening. So how common is disordered eating in athletics? The problem when we're looking at this is that each bit of scientific research done in this area when they're trying to find out how common disordered eating and eating disorders are, is that there's always different ways of defining disordered eating. And often I think we might be underestimating how prevalent it is in athletics. We know it is very, very common in normal people, <laughs> i.e. those who don't compete in a sport. We think it might affect between 50 to 75% of women and over 40% of teenagers. And we see a massive range that is reported in research on athletes from 1% to as high as 62. I just want to emphasize here that we're talking about disordered eating, not clinical eating disorders. The two are very different. In my reading of the science, I am often finding that the way they are defining what disordered behavior is around food and exercise is really only on that extreme end of it. So they're not really looking at the disordered eating behaviors and the kind of funky relationships people have with food that are more culturally normal but still might be problematic or disordered for athletes. In other words, the problem is they're only really assessing for eating disorder behavior and there doesn't seem to be any distinction between disordered eating and eating disorders in this kind of research. So I'd like to propose that often disordered eating is so normalized that we can't even recognize it. And this can filter down even into research. Research really doesn't show that we have an eating disorder pandemic as such in athletes, 
But do we have a disordered eating pandemic that just flies under the radar and is missed in research? So what is your experience? Do you think we have a problem? And do you recognize some of these attitudes and behaviors mentioned by me in the last slide in either yourself or fellow athletes? So who is at risk? I want to do a little bit of myth busting here for some of the coaches and athletes out there. Disordered eating is not exclusive to female athletes or those in smaller bodies. It, affect, it affects and is found in athletes of all genders and body sizes. Everyone is at risk and we cannot assume that everyone, anyone is immune. We actually know that men are more likely to present or show in clinic or um, to like a medical professional with long-term eating disorders than for example a clinical eating disorder. Is this because reds are is harder to, to detect in men? It is also important to highlight that there may be a lot of stigma attached to disordered eating in men because is it seen as a woman's issue? Does this mean that men are less likely to reach out until it is very severe and affecting all aspects of their life? Sport is thought to be protective for women in the development of eating disorders, but not for men. Higher percentage of men versus women with anorexia nervosa participate in sport. It is thought that this might be because sport helps with increasing self-esteem, which is thought to be protective in disordered eating development. But research might also suggest that while sport is protective for some clinical eating disorders, it can be a trigger and a motive for disordered eating. It is also not right to continue the idea that disordered eating and eating disorders have a look. It is important that coaches and nutritionists don't assume that reds and any other issues around disordered eating is only found in smaller bodied individuals. Negative impacts of disordered eating and exercise are experienced in people of all body sizes. And I always say at risk until proven otherwise. So what might disordered eating look like? What are the symptoms and behaviors that we see? This is absolutely not an exhaustive list and disordered eating behavior can be around anything to do with food at all. It can also be associated with some other eating behaviors. It is often perceived that some of the things on this list are okay. You know, what's the harm of them? And for some people, they stay at a level and not cause any further problems. Like I said earlier, just because you do one or a few of these things, sometimes doesn't mean you have disordered eating. It's more to do with what we are doing most of the time and our emotional reaction to that. I don't have time today to talk through example scenarios or the thoughts behind every single one of these. So I'm going to quickly go through, I think two or three, just to show how some of these things can start very innocently and potentially get out of hand. I'm also gonna talk about what I normally do in clinic when this issue crops up. So I'm gonna talk about my top thing on the list here, which is tracking or counting a food intake. And I'm talking using MyFitnessPal or whatever other apps people are using these days to weigh, measure, and estimate their food intake. I think estimate is the key word here, as it's really not very accurate, even if you weighed every single gram of food consumed. I get this question a lot, and I think people think tracking is the perfect solution for sports nutrition and to achieve their performance levels or achieve performance goals. I think it is also assumed that it is something that I do as a sports nutritionist, and I do not. And I will explain in a minute that the only time I use it is when I'm estimating intakes for clients um, as a one-off rather than an everyday thing. Even then, I don't use it for everybody, and I certainly don't ask for a detailed food diary on the first consultation. I assess if doing that process might be difficult or problematic for that person before launching in to asking for information on their food intake. Okay, so it can, and I say can very tentatively here, not be a disordered habit for everybody. One of the issues with tracking is that it draws attention to every single morsel of food that is being put into your body. It also distracts from what your body really wants and needs and enhances the disconnection that is often seen in disordered eating. Basically, this disconnection occurs because you're re relying on an app or sports nutritionist to tell you how much to eat and instead our body's needs are ignored. But what happens when we go to a social event? Someone else is cooking for us, or we end up eating the same things on rotation, day in, day out, because they're easy to put into the app and we're used to it. That's when it starts becoming an issue. Essentially, what I'm trying to encourage you is that you can trust your body, and an app or even another human being guiding our usage of this app cannot respond to changes in energy needs in the way our body can do on its own. 
And what are we noticing? That one of the things on this list then leads to another. For example, with, when we're chronically counting our food intake, we might be excluding different food groups. We also might be able to eat socially. Um, we might be you know, avoiding the fun foods that we enjoy because they don't fit within the parameters that have been set. So this leads on nicely to when is it a problem? So when is disordered eating a problem? When are my eating problem? When are my eating habits a problem that goes beyond just you know the odd disordered behaviour? Um, what's the harm in cutting out or removing a food group? Some people might say, or is there really something wrong with avoiding so-called processed foods? So what if I feel hungry and don't eat for the next few hours? Those are questions I get regularly. And yes, as I've said it a few times before, doing these things occasionally will not necessarily be an issue. But once they become frequent and we are ticking them off, ticking quite a few off the list as regular behaviours, that's when it might suggest a change from regularly normal eating to more consistent disordered eating. It is also important to remember that not all disordered eating is intentional. And even then, disordered eating is not your fault. You might not have an intention to lose weight or control weight, but still engage in the, some of these behaviours. But I also need to highlight that just because it isn't intentional doesn't mean it's not a, pro a problem. So what sort of things are we looking for to highlight that eating, eating behaviours and relationship with food is possibly a problem? Basically, that finding, choosing, or finding or choosing what foods to eat is challenging for someone, so they might be showing indecision or lack of available options when they actually do have an abundance of food. Stress around food generally, so they maybe get distressed about the foods that they have to choose to eat or that they have chosen to eat. Anxiety before, after, or during eating. Guilt that is difficult to deal with around certain foods or a feeling of being out of control. But simply put, if food is concerning you, makes you feel unhappy or causes you stress, it might be time to try and create a more positive relationship. Seek help with a nutrition professional or therapist that specializes in disordered eating specifically. Often food issues arise and it is often not the food that is the problem. Could there be underlying issues around control, anxiety and stress that causes us to use food as an emotional crutch? Seeking help when these feelings arise can be tricky. How do we identify them? And it might be useful to keep a brief journal for a period of time, noting feelings around food and trying to unpack which in particular caused the most difficulty. If you feel unable to help yourself or don't know where to start, I would recommend seeking help from a sensibly aligned sports nutrition professional or dietitian. Let them know that you want to improve your relationship with food and ask how they can help. And I want to encourage you that disordered isn't disciplined, it is dangerous. So moving on to kind of the disordered side of exercise, and that is called sometimes compulsive exercise. So disordered relationships with exercise or unhealthy engagement in exercise can also be known as compulsive exercise. And I will say this, it can be very, very hard to identify this in athletes because it is almost a requirement of the sport to exercise more than the regular person. And unhealthy relationships with movement and activity can be masked as dedication or commitment. As I said previously, disordered is not dedication, it is dangerous. And often athletes are praised for doing more. I actually want to get, in the, get us in the way of praising athletes for doing less and taking rest. In my experience in clinic, clinic and as shown in research, it can be linked to or found in people who also have a funky relationship with food, and sometimes the compulsive exercise, so if someone's kind of like exercising more than regular or using it as a way to control their weight, it is often found before kind of disordered eating habits crop up. So it's kind of one of the first signs that something might be going away. There is a distinction between the athlete who will listen to their bodies by honoring its need for rest and the athlete who never takes rest days and spends a lot of non-training time being active in an unhealthy way. It might be difficult initially to figure out which one you are, but it usually doesn't take very much digging and reflecting to work out. Do you identify with any of the sentiments that I have on the screen right now? There's no shame in having these feelings at all. Many people will have felt like this at some point, but it might be useful to try and reframe your thinking around training and activity. It is important to give yourself and your body the rest it deserves. 
So what does a healthy relationship with ex exercise and training sound like? I'm going to try and reframe the thoughts written here to show what a healthy mindset, mindset might look like for some people. So instead of saying, I don't need rest days, it might be a good idea to reframe that as, I honor my body's need for rest and I am good at identifying it when it needs it. So I spend all my free time doing additional activities. Um, that kind of comes under the same one. Uh, I have a goal and a plan in mind for all training that I do. I am flexible and can adjust my training to work around other social opportunities, work commitments, and other things that life throws at me. I do not train to burn work off or earn food, and I don't reward myself with it either. I don't push my body to do more than what my coach recommends. I have a good idea of when the training load or pain is too much. And I have other coping strategies to manage my mental health and mood apart from exercise. So those are just some little phrases that are maybe in contrast to what's on the screen and are sort of showing how we want to try and reframe the compulsive exercise mindset into a healthier relationship with exercise. So when is compulsive exercise a problem? As I've said before, and I feel like a parrot saying that, but doing one or more of these things occasionally around exercise is not necessarily disordered. Some signs that it might be are on the slide. So that might be, you know, you're exercising so much that you're compromising your recovery between different sessions, that you definitely have a go hard or go home attitude at every training session you do. There's maybe anxiety around missing training that goes beyond the kind of normal dedication of an athlete. And um, maybe if you're unable to take time off when sick, stressed, or have other like life requirements, um, that you ignore your body's needs for rest and also for food, that there's maybe a struggle or resistant mindset to true rest. And I'm talking about, you know, actual time where we take out and we recharge our body and recharge our emotions, or where it is the only method of emotional comfort. So we're going to do our second pause of the day. Um, so I want you to take two minutes um, to reflect and think about some of the things I have just discussed. Can you think of a time where you were on this mind, where you're in this mindset or engaged in these kind of behaviors? I want you to think about what it looked like for you. What were the things you did? What happened? How did it make you feel? How did others respond to you? Or is this a struggle for you right now? So let's press pause in this video, take out your notepad and pen, and take as long as you need. So I hope that pause was interesting and maybe brought up some things for you and allowed you to think about the things that I was talking about. So disordered eating, no big deal, right? I find regularly that some of the symptoms and consequences um, I'm about to mention are often missed in athletes or blamed on something different entirely, not the act of under eating itself. So it is important that you can recognize the signs that are unique to you to identify when things have gone too far or you're not fueling your body properly. And I suppose the purpose of this is also to raise awareness that disordered eating is not without consequence. We know that there are potentially long-term consequences of disordered eating, and that is eating disorders and REDS. But what are the other potential short-term consequences that might happen in less severe cases that might also help us to identify a time of disordered eating that has happened in the past or to help us identify it in the future? Did you reflect on any of these consequences when you were having our little pause two minutes ago? If you have struggled with disordered eating, or exercise mindsets, it might be good to have a look at these consequences and see if you can connect the dots. So, like when any food group or type is taken away, or we're in a restrictive mindset, we think about food or that particular food much more regularly. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. But basically, if we're restricting ourselves, all of our bodies can think about is food. <laughs> Weight and bodies are very difficult to change. Even with a so-called sensible, sensible approach, our bodies fight weight loss. And if extreme measures are used, it makes it harder to force our bodies to exist in a smaller or leaner way. Weight cycling is when your body mass increases and decreases regularly 
over a number of years or a period of time. And this is known to have long-term health effects, even in people of, I hate to say it, but lower or normal bodies. And this can be inclusive of heart disease or early death. Athlete mental health has been a growing topic of discussion. And I am so glad that we are finally having these discussions and conversations. But often I find that this chat mostly circulates around positive mindsets, mindfulness, and without really considering the disordered eating and funky relationship with food and over-exercising can have profound impacts on our mental health and mental well-being. And what I don't think people realize is that even with all of the mindfulness in the world or being the most mindful person, if someone is mistreating their body and not supporting it with adequate food or punishing with over-exercise, it will be difficult to improve our mental health if an essential aspect of self-care and body respect is not being met. So for the second batch of consequences, hopefully I'm not bringing more bad news, I'm going to chat through some of these physical consequences. So the other page was kind of more the mental consequences of disordered eating. And these are some of maybe the physical consequences and negative things that can happen in disordered eating or whenever we're under eating or in a restrictive mindset. So IBS and digestive issues are more common in those who eat in a disordered way. For example, going for long periods of time without eating or not eating enough can really annoy and irritate our stomach and guts. But this is often never viewed as being caused by disordered eating. In my experience, people usually launch straight in to cutting out gluten, carbs or dairy in order to fix themselves. If you or someone you know struggles with IBS symptoms, you can just Google the symptoms, it is best to try and achieve regular eating patterns, for example, eating every two to three hours before launching into low FODMAP diets or the removal of certain food groups, which will likely only make restrictive eating worse. It is much easier to blame food than consider how the way in which we eat might be affecting our bodies. It is also worthwhile to note that stress and anxiety, whether food related or not, has real and significant impacts on gut functioning. This is kind of the same with gastritis and reflux. Your system will generally be unhappy when you're eating, when you aren't eating enough, and it will respond by delaying stomach em emptying, which can make symptoms worse in terms of heartburn, gastritis, and reflux. Another thing that people often experience is headaches, fatigue, and brain fog. This is basically related to a lack of energy in the system or basically something being out of whack. Our bodies are very smart and they show us signs and symptoms when we need more food. So other signs you need more food. As I said, our bodies are actually really smart and intelligent and know what we need. And they also try to tell us. They try to tell us pretty hard, but unfortunately we get quite good at ignoring them or not understand what it is they are trying to tell us. There's a little bit of a communication barrier here. It is a good skill to be able to identify when you haven't been eating enough and responding to that. Those signs will be individual to everybody. Um, while it's great to be able to recognize some of the consequences as mentioned on the previous slide, we want to try and catch it before disordered eating has an impact on performance, mental health and athlete well-being. So some of those kind of early signs, like from a day-to-day -day perspective, is that you're still thinking about food after a meal. Um, our bodies are pretty intelligent. If our bodies haven't had enough, they will kind of force you to think about food a little bit more and to think about the foods that might give us satisfaction. You might also find an inability to focus, irritability, headache and mood changes, stomach growling for obvious reasons, struggling with recovery between training sessions, increased injury, soreness and bruising, sick regularly, or are you listening to this and thinking of food? Are you hungry right now? But it is also important to note if you've not been eating enough or dieting or restricting for a while, for example, you're ignoring hunger signals for a period of time, our bodies get good, less good at recognizing those signals. If you're someone who never feels properly hungry or has a generally low appetite, it is a likely sign you might need to be eating more regularly. Um, regular feelings of hunger are a good sign our bodies are working well from a metabolism perspective, but sport and hard training can make it hard for us to identify these as it blunts, blunts and kind of dampens down some of the normal hunger signals that we think of. Um, but it's during this time frame that athletes need to follow adequate recovery and fueling strategies to support and honour their bodies when they don't necessarily feel hungry. 
So we're going to talk about um, a little exercise that I like to use. Um, and this demonstrates to athletes just how much time and energy we give to thinking about food, exercise, and our bodies. When we're in a restrictive or dieting mentality, our brains become a little bit obsessed with food, and it is one day way of our body telling us that we're hungry, but we can't, but it can actually be quite torturous, as often we don't recognize the reason for it. Making peace with food and eating regularly can free up the space in our brains for the important things that matter and might allow us more opportunity to address other factors contributing to performance that honestly could be more beneficial than nutrition. For example, mental skills, positivity, and taking appropriate rest. The idea is that if is that we don't want food and nutrition to take up a massive proportion of our thoughts and energy. If it is, it might be another sign that our relationship with food could do with improving. What you can do is download this document from the link in my bio on Instagram, and it can be useful to journal how much space is currently being taken up and where you think you might like to be in the future. So, now we're going to talk about one of my least favorite things to discuss, but also a very important topic nonetheless. And it's something that we needs to be discussed incredibly sensitively and, um, you know, just making sure that we're talking about it in a way that honors people. Um, and that is weight and performance. Look, I get it. The desire to be smaller, lighter or leaner than what we are is there in the sport. And then it is also there is additional pressure to look a certain way coming from social media and our culture outside that. While not all events in athletics have an emphasis on lightness or lower body mass for performance, there may be other pressures to change or maintain your body at a certain parameter during your time in the sport. It might also not be everyone's experience to feel this pressure, but it is likely that lots relate to some of the ideas that losing weight or increasing muscle, muscle mass while losing fat or getting lean will improve performance. And I really emphasize and relate to that sentiment. It is a very difficult mindset to overcome. It can be hard to accept that weight loss and changing our body doesn't lead to performance increases. We are so lucky. Athletics in some ways is a great sport that a wide range of bodies are acceptable across the different events. But I would love to see more, more variety being acceptable within the different event groups. We do have a toxic culture of fat phobia pervasive, pervasive underfueling, and a weight-centric approach that is evident in both coaching and nutrition. So where does this idea come from? That to perform well, you need to look a certain way? It usually relies on anecdotal evidence. Um, and this basically is a little bit of he said, she said, people using their own experiences or their perception of their own experiences to give other people advice. And that sort of filters down through the generations in some ways. And this means that we are not relying on true scientific evidence to support the, basically there is no scientific evidence to support the idea that weight loss leads to direct performance improvement. Um, there was an article written last year in response to a comment that I made about weight not mattering in terms of performance and also in response to the Mary Kane story, which broke with her relationship with Alberto Salazar and how he pressured her greatly to stay a certain body mass and lose a lot of weight. What it essentially said in this response article, that we are failing teens by telling them their body mass doesn't matter. The justification was that this individual experienced performance improvement when they lost weight. As we have learned, um, that is anecdotal evidence that's not based on science. One person's experience does not mean it will be the same for all. This statement has left out so many things. It made me angry because it is not scientifically true or just to say, I lost weight and I got faster. And it's also dangerous to continue to push that idea. It has been pushed for decades and it's nothing new or exciting or beyond the ordinary to be coming out and saying that. We are failing athletes telling them that weight is a pivotal performance determinant. We are failing athletes if we continue to push that message. There are a thousand other things that can be done to improve performance that doesn't have the detrimental effects of weight loss. So what research fails to do in this area? Um, there's some research that you can find online about you know, um, weight loss and athletics or for athletic individuals. 
And I am very critical of that Ray weight loss kind of research. Usually what it fails to do is that it doesn't have adequate sample sizes. So what sports nutritionists and all these people are maybe basing their evidence on is a scientific study that looks at a weight loss um, kind of protocol or strategy in like eight athletes. We can't apply that to every athlete in athletics. It also is, doesn't address sustainability. So it doesn't look at how sustainable this weight loss that they achieved in the research is over time. So they're not looking at six months time to see where the athletes are at with um, you know, their body mass. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Has it stayed the same? Um, they also, where they are showing that there's increased performance um, in these studies, they often don't directly measure performance so they're only looking at some like indicators of performance. So for example, they might be looking at like CMJ jumps, they might be looking at, um, you know, bike test measures in athletics athletes, which realistically we're not cyclists. So why are they using that? Um, and one major thing in these things is that they don't assess athlete well-being, relationship with food and eating disorder risk. And that is a major, major problem in uh, nutrition research generally is that it often doesn't assess the effects of dieting on well-being. And then lastly, physics and metabolism are not the same thing. They are completely different. Being physically lighter does not always mean that moving, fa that moving is faster and easier. If the body has lost weight through restrictive behaviors and ignoring hunger cues, it is much more likely that a per performance can occur. The best body size for sport is the size your body wants to be by engaging in self-care behaviors, which are regular eating, eating what you want and feeling satisfied. So I want you to continue to challenge the myth that weight, is not, uh, essential, weight loss is not essential for performance improvement. And one thing I always ask my clients is weight loss at what cost? So why does this idea of weight loss for performance not stand true? I could list many things, and as we discussed in the previous slide, it is not always appropriate or right to think that way. But for starters, weight loss and fat loss is not always easy to achieve. And I always ask my clients, as I say, weight loss, what is the cost? Weight loss is not without consequences. When we aren't giving our bodies enough energy when trying to lose weight, it often has an impact on the level of training that we can achieve. You cannot increase your training volume or intensity while cutting back on food and um, performance and long-term health might be effective, affected. We know that research doesn't show long-term measurable performance improvements or increases with weight loss, but what does it actually show? It shows increased injuries, illness, lack of energy to complete training, increased recovery time, loss of muscle mass, decreased performance, loss of social life, effective relationships can hamper next season and increase body mass over time, which is ultimately what people are trying to avoid anyway. So why would you start it? So the next time you're feeling hung up about your body weight or someone says you need to lose weight to get faster, stronger or better, just think about the DGAF skills. I don't need to tell you what they mean, but I'm sure you can work it out yourself. So what are some of the solutions? What is normal eating? I think sometimes we get hung up on what normal eating is and it looks different for everyone. Different cultures can play a role, people's likes and dislikes, income status and sport are all, of, all involved. But generally the basis of normal eating is a combination of all these things. No food rules, no exclusions, no stress, anxiety or guilt around food, flexibility, responding to body cues, eating when hungry, enjoyment and mostly eating energizing foods. That is not to say that we won't struggle with, with these issues some of the time or at certain meals, etc. But the goal for me when working with an athlete is that the majority of the time, all the things considered here um, are thought about and being met. If you're working with a sports nutritionist or dietitian, or if anyone giving nutrition advice suggests something that doesn't fit with this, then it might be a good idea to consider why you're working with them or challenging them on your ideas. And particularly if you are someone who is struggling with disordered eating and seeks professional help and they are not addressing these issues or something that they suggest to you goes against this, it might be fine time to find a new um, therapist to work with. Sports nutrition can easily fit within the parameters of these, but I think it is often assumed that it can't. What things do you think 
what do you think are things that athlete tends to do that go against this? For example, you know, ignoring hunger signals to try and lose weight, not eating cake or chocolate during summer season for fear that it will affect performance, eat the damn cake, it won't have an effect, feeling stressed about what are the right and good foods per for performance nutrition strategies, eating foods that do not give us life and don't satisfy us in a way that makes us feel good for the sake of performance or fat loss. As an example, and briefly, no food rules and no exclusions. So for athletes, that means that all foods are on the menu, regardless of the season, training. And the idea is that we eat foods we enjoy. Crisps and chocolate, sweets, cake, whatever that might be for you, that we maybe avoid or allowed and freely there. Once the freedom is viewed, we change our attitude and instead of feeling restricted, we have a more positive relationship with that food and might actually crave, crave it less and eat it less in some circumstances. And this can prevent overeating and stop that out of control feeling around a particular food. I think it is very easy to get distracted by nutrition strategies, weight loss and dieting when involved in competitive sport, but it is possible to compete and perform and maintain a truly positive relationship with food. I always like people to think about their relationship with food and training to be the most important thing to work on first. People often want to jump straight up to the supplements and recovery strategies without addressing some of the issues that are going on underneath. If those are left unaddressed, it can make the rest completely pointless. For example, you wouldn't necessarily launch into competition work or you know, in-season training, high level, high intensity in the middle of winter. We do base work, we do technique development, and we've all had years under our belts of developing our skill and craft of the sport. See these aspects of normal eating as the base work before adding the fancy performance nutrition stuff. It might not be shiny and sparkly, these normal things, but they'll serve you better in the long run. I believe that all athletes deserve to be free from restrictions, mental health impacts, and negative outcomes of disordered eating. It's time that we end the culture that disordered eating is okay, normal, or expected for those who participate in athletics. I'll be going through some more of these principles and ideas in a later webinar that I'm hosting. So if you're interested in learning more about um, strategies to help normal eating athletes and to encourage a positive relationship with food, um, it's going to be on the 19th of July and you can sign up by the link in my bio on Instagram. So. Briefly, how to improve relationship with food and exercise. I wanted to provide some small solutions or things that might be able to be worked on initially if you identify some of the things in yourself that are showing a negative or per relationship with food. I'm going to briefly discuss a few of these and hopefully they resonate and they sound good. You can Google some of them on the internet and lots of things will come up. So food neutrality. This is about giving yourself full and unconditional permission to eat and is centered around not having food rules or restrictions um, to the types, quantities, and all of that foods that are eaten. Food neutrality is the first step to unconditional permission to eat. And it, it means mentally taking food down off a pedestal in terms of health, performance, and enjoyment, and working towards being more emotionally neutral towards all types of food. So it's not that we don't enjoy eating these foods, it's just we don't morally judge them. Um, and a good way that we can start is by labeling food, and we can start this by stopping labeling food as good, bad, real, fake, junk food, healthy food, it's all just food. By making peace with the foods we're eating and not attaching emotional or moral judgments, this is a start to being more free to eat what our bodies need. It can be helpful to write down or examine all the food and exercise rules and restrictions that you might have. Um, I like to describe this, or maybe not so like to describe this, as that it's almost like you're carrying around the baggage of all those food rules. Um, and what we want to do is open the suitcase, open the bag, have a look inside and really examine where they came from, how they might have affected us and try and detangle all of the stuff that's going on in there. And this is where help from a professional might come in. They might be able to help guide you to looking at your food rules <clears throat> and quirks in a healthy and productive way. Seeking help for disordered eating or exercise is appropriate. Just because you might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not that bad. Maybe, you know, you might think you aren't the worst person 
but it can be amazing what reaching out to others with the know-how and experience of working with disordered eating can do. So if you struggle with compulsive exercise or some negative relationships or attitudes around exercise, I would try for a few weeks to include in your training diary or a note on your phone the intention and motivation behind each piece of activity that you're doing. Is it actually achieving something? Is it working towards the goal that you have? And why are we feeling the need to maybe go on a three hour hammer rest day when we're already tired? That is something that I'm seeing a lot recently, um, a lot of kind of additional activity outside athletics that seems to be very driven and compulsive. Try and think, is the activity that I am doing honoring my body, does it feel right? And is it actually helping towards my performance goals? So reframing some of those thoughts. I did a little bit of this earlier on as well, but I just wanted to show some side by sides. Based on some of these ideas that I've just mentioned around food neutrality, making peace with food and detangling food rules, I wanted to show how thoughts can be reframed. It's not to say that the thoughts on the left hand side of the screen are bad as such, but simply, simply they're displaying some of the disordered qualities that might have been discussed throughout this talk. When trying to improve our relationship with food and exercise, it might be useful to write out or to have some comebacks prepared for when our minds have negative or unhelpful, unhelpful thoughts. So for example, someone saying, this food is bad, I shouldn't eat it because it will affect my performance. You know, we want to change that into a more positive um, saying. So something you could come back with that is, no foods are good or bad, and no one food will impact my performance. So some people who maybe struggle with rest days is, they might say, I don't need rest days. Um, the comeback for that is, I should honor my body with sufficient rest and recovery. And it's also important to remember that rest and recovery is really important for physiological adaptations to exercise. So whenever we're looking at, um, we're kind of talking about hunger a little bit more, um, some people might be like, oh, I'm always hungry, like why am I always hungry? I just ate, why am I hungry again? Um, we can kind of come back with that as regular hunger is a good sign, my digestion is working well, hunger is not the enemy. And then the idea that athletes don't eat cake or whatever your kind of favorite food might be in that way, is that athletes can eat all foods freely. And I want to encourage you that that is definitely a true fact. So thank you for listening today. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of how can I learn more. Um, there will be a webinar available next week on Athletics Ireland's YouTube. So I think that's the 2nd of July. Um, and it will be there forever more. So there's no rush really to watch it. And I'm also hosting a final webinar in this series on the 19th of July. Um, I'm hosting that one on my own. There's a small sign up fee and this is, in my opinion, the most important for individual athletes in terms of improving their relationship with food while also considering performance factors. We will dive into more into more the ways of supporting performance without resulting in disordered eating and what is the alternative, how to use less brain space when choosing foods. And I would really appreciate the support on that as I know these webinars are freely available on YouTube to watch. I'm also running a series of series of a three-week online group program for injured athletes. Um, this is a program that is going to be aimed at athletes who are currently injured or experience injuries regularly. Um, I will have sign up available for that soon. This is a three-week course and it only costs £40. It gives you a 20-minute one-to-one reflection session with me after the program as well and it will start on the 27th of September, which feels like a very long time away but I promise it will come around soon. Um, it'll run for three consecutive weeks and it'll cover topics, how to cope with injuries better, nutrition strategies to support injuries, and we'll also have Q&A, high profile athlete, athlete, and lots more. Alternatively, if you're looking for the maximum level of support in your disordered eating or issues with food and exercise, I am currently taking on a limited number of clients at the moment, so get in touch via email if you want to chat. Other resources that are like written by, you know, other people that are, I think are great. Um, there's very few people doing this kind of work in terms of sports nutrition, um, but nutritionist Megan Medrano offers some really great content online for athletes. The Mindful Dietitian, um, her little handle is on the slide there, also does a little bit of sports nutrition stuff, which is great. Um, and general folks to follow, um, if you go on to my, or my business page, which is a non-diet sports nutritionist, and click on who I follow, any of them is good to follow, basically. And um, books that are also good, um, Megan Medrano, the 
dietitian I just mentioned there, she has a, a, like an online ebook about specifically for athletes. It's called Intuitive Fueling. And I would definitely recommend downloading that. It's not very expensive and it's really useful document. Other books to just get you started generally on kind of a non-diet approach or trying to fix your relationship with food is Just Eat It by Laura Thomas. And um, there's also some other podcasts, Mindful Dietitian and Nutrition Matters. We definitely recommend checking out both of those. Um, so if you want to connect with me, I have an Instagram page where I'm most active, kind of <laughs> trying to get that up and running. I'm not um, super active on my feed. I don't post all that often, but I post things in stories all the time and I'm always available for some general chit chat there. Um, my email address is also the non diet sports nutrition at gmail.com. And if you're interested in becoming a client, that is the best way to contact me. Um, so yes, although this is a pre-recorded webinar, we did have some questions that were asked on social media. So I just wanted to go through a couple of them quickly. Um, if you have any other additional questions after watching this or you feel entirely confused, just send me a DM on Instagram or an email and I will try to get back to you. I can't give personalized advice if you're not a client. So it's kind of general questions only. Any questions or reflections, as I said, after this time, please do get in touch. Um, so one of the questions that we got was, um, where should I go for help? As I said before, if you know, you, there should be no shame in um, reaching out for help for either, you know, disordered eating. I think people think it's maybe not serious enough to see a dietitian or sports nutritionist about, but it definitely is there. Um, if it is specifically disordered eating that you're reaching out about, um, I would definitely be looking for someone who has experience in that area, who is passionate about disordered eating. Not all sports dietitians and sports nutritionists are trained in that area. Um, so it's important that you look for someone who is interested in that. Um, I would also say that it's important to have a family circle around you who are available and willing to help you out. Um, so one of the other questions was, how can we help each other combat disordered eating? So I think, remember what I was talking about, um, the kind of language that we use around food and just generally trying to create a positive culture. Um, and that is whereby we're not labeling foods as good or bad. And that we generally try to create an atmosphere in the training group or among our friends and in athletics, whereby food is not the center of attention. Um, we're not spreading information or diet culture or diet chat. Um, I think that's how we can really combat it from the ground up. But I think that we definitely need a little bit of a culture change in terms of the role that food plays in our sport. So the other question was, how can we identify, no, how can someone identify that they might have a problem? I think I've probably hopefully given a um, good explanation for that. Um, you know, if we're not hitting all these things on normally, or, um, you know, signs I need more food is another good one to be looking at. Um, and also having to look back over the slides, when is it a problem for both disordered eating um, and exercise would probably be a good idea there. Um, but yes, hopefully I provided enough information today on, um, you know, how you can identify those problems. It also is a good idea to maybe ask some of the people around you, you know, have you noticed any behavior change or, you know, getting their reflections as well, because that can be very useful. And the last question was, if I am recovered from an eating disorder and still getting injuries, what should I do? Um, so I'm not a physio and also, you know, if you're, I would say probably seeing physio help initially will be the best way to go there. Um, from a new perspective, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really glad that you have made that step recovery and it sounds like, you know, if you've recovered, well done. That's a great, a great thing to have. Um, but I think that, you know, it would be a really good thing to actually seek out positive help and um, maybe someone who could help you look at your relationship with exercise um, and make sure that you are consuming adequate nutrition and getting enough energy in there to support your current training needs. Um, if we're under eating or not eating enough and maybe training too much, that can increase the risk of it and increase the risk of injury. So definitely something to think about. Anyway, I just want to say thank you so much.
for uh, tuning in today. As I say, any more questions, get in touch over time. Thank you.